Greetings, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's good to have you for this lectionary Bible study for November 1st, 2020, which is All Saints Sunday in the lectionary readings. We are going to be looking at a text from Revelation chapter 7, a text from 1 John chapter 3, and we'll be looking at the Beatitudes from Matthew chapter 5. Now, first, a quick note on what All Saints Sunday is. So All Saints Sunday is traditionally a day in which all those who have um, entered into rest during the past year are, in a sense, recognized, celebrated. Um, it's basically a time in which those whom we have lost to death um, but are at rest um, in the Lord are, are I, mean, I wouldn't say celebrated necessarily, it's not in the same sense like a celebration of life service, uh, but simply a recognition of God's grace to them um, and the peace they now have as Christians who've died in the faith. And so uh, sometimes there is a, a reading of names um, and bells get rung and sometimes there's just a special prayer and sometimes there's flowers and it just sort of depends on traditions locally. Um, of what people like to do and what sort of has been established. Um, I think I was on vacation last All Saints Day, and so I don't think we did anything special because um, a guest pastor is not going to try and do something that he used to do or something like that. Um, so we didn't do anything last year and this year. Uh, I'm still trying to sort out maybe what would be the, the right format uh, to do something that for. Um, and so what we're going to find then in the text is a theme of what we call, well, in some ways, a theme of the church triumphant. And that's sort of one of the big ideas about the Revelation text, uh, is the, the church triumphant versus the church militant. Um, and so we recognize, there's a couple different ways to talk about the church. So, uh, so for example, we have the visible church and the invisible church, was a, which is a distinction on here on earth so, the, for a quick handy reference, the visible church is everybody who comes to church on a Sunday, and the invisible church is a subset of that group that comes to church on Sunday and believes. So, we as pastors, theologians, Christians recognize that there are people, there are, at times, there are people in the pews who don't actually have faith in Christ. They're there for some other reason, but we are unable to judge their hearts, and so they make confession, but maybe don't believe or, you know, something along that line. And so they're part of the visible church, but not part of the invisible church. And so that's just a handy distinction. So when we talk about uh, the visible church and, and, and sinners in the church and that sort of thing. Um, but then we have another, uh, another distinction called the church militant and the church triumphant, which is in the hymnal. Um, so if you were to, here's a hymnal, ta-da, there's a section, um, and you would think I would have had a bookmarked before I pulled out the Bible or the hymnal, but I didn't. Um, so in the 600s, next time you're in church or if you have a hymnal at home, in the 600s, we have the section called The Church, and here we have hymns like The Church is One Foundation, um, I think, um, Church of God Elect and Glorious, Built on the Rock, um, and so there's sort of this theme of the life of the church. Um, yeah, The Church is One Foundation is the first one. Okay, good. I wasn't just making stuff up. Lord, keep us steadfast in your word, and then, and then we sort of get The Church Militant, which The Church Militant is different than the church in general in that it's the church at work in the world against the forces of evil, I suppose, if you want to make it dramatic sounding. Um, but it's the church, the church being willing to fight. So there are times when the church must fight and there are times in which the church must work. And there's a difference. Um, so, for example, when the church fights against 
the abomination of abortion or euthanasia. When the church tackles that issue, it's the church militant. We are fighting against forces of evil. Uh, when the church fights against uh, maybe something going on in the community. Um, any, so anytime we're sort of fighting against something that we recognize as evil, we're being the church militant. Uh, sometimes when we're just doing the work of a Christian, we're just being the church. Um, so there's a little bit of that kind of distinction here with the church militant. It's the, the church fighting back evil on earth. And so whether it's fighting against cultural temptations, whether it's fighting against uh, social policies, whether it's fighting against um, whatever the church may find in its situation, um, whenever the church is in a sense fighting, it's the church militant. And we are always fighting not people, but evil itself, whether it be Satan or the, or the evil found in the world or just the brokenness of the world. Um, but so, for example, if we're feeding the poor, we're not being the church militant. I mean, we're sure we're fighting hunger, but that's not really the same thing. Um, we're just sort of serving our neighbor. And so when the church serves its neighbor, it's just kind of being the church. When the church fights against evil, it's being the church militant. And then we have the church triumphant. And so we have the church, the general church, the church militant, and the church triumphant. And the church triumphant also has its own set of hymns, as does the church militant. Uh, so church militant has, uh, for example, Mighty Fortresses Are God, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Uh, the Son of God Goes Forth to War. Uh, Onward Christian Soldiers. Uh, so these are sort of um, fight the good fight. These are hymns that are sort of meant to, in a sense, stir up the troops uh, to, to encourage us, to uplift us, to uh, fight against the evil that we face in life. And that evil takes on, on numerous forms. Um, and so then we have the church triumphant section. And this section um, is fine. So we'll talk about this in a little bit. Um, but here we have Jerusalem the golden, sing with all the saints in glory, Jerusalem my happy home, uh, Jerusalem O city fair and high, behold a host arrayed in white uh, for all the saints. So uh, here we have a lot of uh, hymns, um, thine the amen, thine the praise, though I don't know why that's a church triumphant song, but I like it. So, um, And so then we go from there. Um, and it's sort of a smaller section. So it's helpful to have these distinctions in mind as we, one, approach Revelation chapter 7, because we're going to see the church militant and the church triumphant sort of at work um, or, or being described. And if you don't have those categories, then when I talk to you about it, it's not going to make any sense. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, in First John, we're talking about um, hope and then the Beatitudes is sort of discussing uh, a little bit of all three uh, of those categories. So... Um, so that's sort of the, some of the topics and some of the ideas that are going to be, going to be in the text. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right in, and I'll see if I get into the tangent that I think I might get into, but I'm trying not to for the sake of time. So let's look at the text. We're going to look at 1 John 3, 1 to 3 first. Um, got a little bit of a glare there. I'm going to try and fix that later. So 1 John chapter 3, 1 to 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as he is pure. All right, yeah, um, I, can't, I can't do this text without the following tangent. So I'll work through it and there's going to be more information. And if you've been in one of my Bible studies, you'll pick up on some of the things that I'm talking about, especially with the, some of the stuff in Daniel and we're talking about eschatology and end times and death and resurrection and and those sort of things. So I'm going to try and I'm try and narrow it down a little bit just so we get what the text is saying. So let's take it into parts. So uh, let's see. I'm messing with some buttons here. Um, there we go. So what we have here, so see what kind of love the Father has given to us, 
Okay, so what kind of love is the, has he given to us? That we should be called children of God. So being called children of God is an act of love of the Father. Okay, so the Father gets to decide who his children are. Um, trying to see where that glare is coming from because um, it's anyway. So. What kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. So the love of the Father is expressed in Him calling us children. And not just being called. So um, if I go and say, Eli, um, you're my son now. Uh, I don't just get to, you know, he doesn't become mine. There'd be a lot of paperwork, and, uh, and I don't think Linda wants to necessarily hand him over to me. Um, so... And I don't think Eli necessarily wants to, you know, move in. Uh, but I can't just call him mine and have him be mine. Unlike God, who can both call and when he says so, that's what happens. So the love of the Father calls and then makes it happen. So we are, is what John says here. Uh, so we're called children of God. And because the Father says so, that makes it true. And so we call this, um, and I've talked about this before, uh, but the pro, um, we'll call it the pro proclaiming, oh no, that's not what I wanted. Uh, the performative word. Uh, so the performative word is when God says something and it happens. Uh, so the perfect example is, let there be light, right? And then there was. So Genesis 1 is all, is all about the performative word. Jesus is also all about the performative word. He says to the leper, be clean or, or be healed. He says to the, the uh, paralyzed man, stand up and walk. Um, and so he has this performative word that when he speaks, the things happen. Or the word is then performed. And so this also comes into play. Um, so when they let the uh, man through the roof who's paralyzed on the mat, uh, his friends drop him out in front of Jesus and he says, you know, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees are like, Psh, you can't say that somebody's sins are forgiven. Um, you don't have that authority. And they said, and Jesus responds, well, which is easier to say, uh, stand, or, uh, your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk. Um, and the, the the obvious answer is it's harder to say stand up and walk because everybody can see that visible reality. And so he, he, he proves his power performative word through a uh, physical miracle in order to prove his spiritual authority. So we have that same sort of idea here where, because it's the Father and Christ shares in that power, that if he says we are children, therefore we are. Now, uh, so far so good, no need for a rant. Uh, the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Now, who's him? Um, in the immediate context, it's the Father. So the reason why the world does not know us as children of God is that it did not know the Father. If it doesn't know the Father, then it's not going to know the, know the children. Um, and know here, um, you know, it's not like they weren't acquainted. Um, it's more familiar than... Oh, I never heard of God before, though, so I don't know who you are. No, it's not quite like that. Um, but they, they don't know his ways or his, his reasoning, so they don't really don't, they don't know his word. Uh, so if they don't know him, if they don't know the Father, they don't know his revelation, they don't know what he's given to the world, then they're not going to know those who live that way uh, or understand them. So um, here, here we're kind of talking about a, a familiarity um, not a, you know, if the world recognizes that, or the world sometimes recognizes that there is a God, but they don't really care. And so when we're talking about the world in this sort of collective. Uh, it's not like, oh, we never heard of God before, therefore we don't know what you're doing. It's more of a inability to understand our actions as Christians. So, so far, oh, okay, let's, this is going to be a silly example. Um, but there is, in a sense, 
a gums sense of humor. So that I get from my grandmother and uh, my dad to a degree. Um, but there's just sort of this, I don't know, we, we tell bad jokes and we think they're funny kind of thing. And if I was, <laughs> so for example, uh, to further this example, uh, in, you know, in my first sermon here at Hammond, I tried to tell a joke and nobody laughed. And, you know, I had to explain that this is, this is as good as the jokes are going to get. They're not going to get better than this. So you might as well just accept that this is my sense of humor and we're just going to have to live with it for the next, you know, however long you keep me. Um, and so if you don't know the family or if you don't know me, you won't necessarily get the jokes. Um, in the same way, in, in, in kind of the same way, if you don't know the father, if you don't know uh, the patriarch of this family and the way he does things, you won't understand why the children do what they do. In this, so this is sort of that sort of idea here is that we should, I mean, this to turn into a little bit more law here, uh, our actions should confound the world because they don't understand why we do the things that we do. Uh, and if they're in line with the world, then we've found a different father, in a sense, or a part of a different family, to, to stretch that metaphor. So, um, if we don't get, in a sense, if we don't get the joke, then we're probably not part of the family. Um, and, you know, Cammy gets the, the humor now of the Gummas family because she's been around for a while. Um, and so, you know, her sense of humor can, or, she, understand, she understands our sense of humor. I don't know if she's appreciative, but you know, she understands when we make terrible jokes. Um, so that's kind of part of what's going on here in verse one. Now looking back at uh, two and three, we sort of get uh, what's gonna be called the now and not yet. So looking at two, beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet. So these, this is a big idea. Um, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, this is, uh, this he is Jesus. Um, so he's the one who's going to appear. We shall be like him. So it's important to know who the he is. So this he and him are pointing to Jesus, which is a key idea here. So when Jesus appears, we shall be like Jesus because we shall see Jesus as he is, as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in Jesus purifies himself as Jesus is pure. So, what we have here is a, I suppose, a future-looking confession because it takes, basically, sometimes these papers move on this mat and sometimes they don't. Uh, stick person, he's looking, he does not have laser eyes. Uh, he's looking into the future, so he's looking forward in the time. Here's the future. See? I don't know how you would draw the future, um, but the person is looking towards the future while being present now, so he's in the present, and he knows what's happening here, but he also knows what's happening in the future. So, when we look at the text, we know that right now we are children of God, and that means something that has an effect on things. Uh, but we also recognize that we are not yet full recipients of what the future will hold, or what the title of God's child will hold. So one of the things, I have this little chart, and we'll, because everybody loves charts, um, it's a little U-shape here, little dots right here. We have the cross, we have the fall, 
we have creation uh, and we have the new heavens and a new earth and we have us right here in the middle in what we call the church age and this is going to be important when we get to revelation in just a minute so if we have the cross here basically everything is good right here then we have the fall and everything becomes bad so now we're in if this is good down here is bad um, and so everything's good then we have the fall into sin and everything becomes bad and then we have christ on the cross and with christ on the cross we now live after the cross we live still in this era of badness right we're still living on this timeline but we also have certain end time realities or day of the lord realities um so what we'd call not yet realities and by that i mean are you forgiven of all your sins yes but that would happen here so forgiveness and forgiveness of sins and mercy from god would occur here on the judgment day but you're told about it now uh, are you a child of god destined for eternal life yes but that reality would be here but you know that now already and so when we're living here in this church age the time after christ's death resurrection and ascension we have certain end time realities of the new heavens and new earth like the promise of like knowing you're going to be raised from the dead knowing you're going to have life everlasting is this sort of last day reality that we already know while living here in the bad um, so we know that we're going to be raised we know that we're forgiven we know that we're righteous uh, early and that's sort of this idea that jesus comes early uh, to save humanity um, because we know that he was going to show up on this day to judge the living and the dead but he came early to save uh, all those who live uh, in this whole section uh, so it's not just these people right here that he's saving but everybody uh, so that's sort of a little bit of this now and not yet part and that's a bit of the tangent that i warned you about um, and the last part so that's verse two verse three um, he who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure this is one of the other things while being um, future looking so if we're looking towards the future and what the reality of that future is such as holy righteous uh, being in Christ's presence. Am I still on camera? I am. Okay. So if the future involves being holy, being righteous, being in Christ's presence, and we are people who know this reality and are future looking, we will then take on this idea of future uh, reality and apply it to our present. In other words, if your hope is this we start living that hope now and so if our hope is to be as pure and as holy and as righteous as christ then in our present reality we strive to be holy and righteous as christ is holy and righteous and so as we look forward to the future in our hope we then uh, turn to uh, these things that we know will be our reality and try to apply them to our lives today um, now here i'm going to extend a little bit of my uh, my current thought process and you would think is he ever going to get to the next text and the answer is i don't know uh, so when we think about uh, faith hope and love this is first corinthians 13 13 um, and the greatest of these is love you know why well because faith in jesus christ leads to the hope 
that we have of eternal life, the future that we're looking forward to, and that hope then turns back to us for love to our neighbor. So faith leads to hope, leads to love. So why is love the greatest? Because love is the result of both our faith and our hope. And so if we have the faith and hope in line, then our love should follow in suit because we are looking in faith to the future hope, which shows us these things, which then shapes how we live our lives as Christians, as those with faith and hope, and what that shows is a love for one another. Okay, so now we understand all the things that might be going on in 1 John 3, 1 to 3. I thought that was the easy text to start with, so buckle up. Um, let's look at Revelation. Yeah. So the lectionary allows for the text to be extended. And by that, I mean we could have a longer reading. And I've said before in videos past that I usually like to do the longer reading uh, when possible so that we get more of Scripture uh, read in, in, in church. Because what else are we doing besides hearing the Word of God? So why not listen to Scripture? However, I will show you here for a moment on my study Bible. Again, that glare is just... I wish I could do something about that. Um, so you could start at verse 2, which is up here. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And then there's a long list. And there's 12,000 from every tribe uh, of Israel. And so why didn't I include that in the reading? Well, because I didn't want you to zone out in church. Um, if I had to spend 30 seconds saying 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad. Um, you might kind of get bored, and it doesn't really add anything to the text. Um, so that's, uh, that's why it's not included. Um, but I was going to mention, uh, I'll mention when we get through the reading, a little bit of the 144,000 and how that plays a role in this text. Okay. So... Um, Revelation 7, 9 to 17. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders of the four, and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes." Okay, so this is why I talked about the church, the church militant, and the church triumphant, and why I took a little bit of time of that now and not yet chart, because this text is sort of tying it all together. And what we're seeing in this vision, and along with a little bit of the text from, from 2 to 7, or, or 2 to 8, um, outside of the, the list of tribes, um, which that has a purpose too. Um, 
is we are seeing in this text a vision of the church militant, a vision of the church triumphant, and a vision of sort of both uh, at the end. And so there's a lot of things going on here in this text, and you have to be willing to recognize that we're talking about multiple points in time all at the same time because the vision given to John is one of, I suppose, an eternal perspective and not one in which is rooted or anchored in historical time. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that when we think about Revelation, at times we are given a perspective of us looking up, and sometimes we're given the perspective of um, God looking down, and sometimes we're kind of stuck in both. And this is one of those texts where you're seeing kind of two different ways of understanding reality as it stands, I guess. Um, so, what I mean by all of that is that when we read this text, what we see is how God views the situation on earth at any given point, and how we are to hope or, or to see reality as it will be at some point in the future. And we're sort of given both of those perspectives at the same time, because John is a human being entering into the courts of heaven and being able to see the, the grandness of, of, in a sense, eternity. Um, and we can sort of, so one of the ways to think about this um, is that there is, um, so we have God, God's up here, and we have time for us. So there is a beginning, and there is an end. And God sits, so we are, you know, people are living here, and here, and here, and here, and everywhere in between. And so, uh, from our perspective, we, ex we understand, oh, okay, if we're living here, and then, you know, George Washington was here, and the Apostle Paul was here, and Abraham was here, and here's Adam and Eve, okay? So we can understand that we can look back, and in some ways we can look forward. Here is where our, you know, our future uh, progeny will be, um, you know, our kids' as kids' as kids' as kids will be up here. We don't know their names. We don't know what they're going to look like, but we know they're going to be in the future, assuming that the end doesn't come first. So we, I'm going to say this is us right here, can look backwards and to some regards can look forward. Um, we can certainly look, we are through Scripture given the ability to look all the way to here to the end. We don't really get to look too much past this moment because um, we, I, I don't know, just Scripture doesn't reveal what life out here necessarily has with much detail. Um, so we are able to future look a little, but most of our perspective is, is here. The general idea of God's perspective on eternity is that he stands up here and he can see the whole thing from his perspective. So this is one way of understanding God and time, that God is over time, and that he, from his omniscient and omnipotent perspective, is one from above it. And so he is not in this timeline, he is over it. Uh, and so he's not part of time. And, you know, okay, so we're going to say this is, so for example, uh, one way in which I talk about time is time as change. 
right? So there's change from here to here, there's change from here to here, there's change from here to here, there's change. This whole time frame is, is marked by change. We, this is what we do with history. This is how we mark history as we mark it by changes that happen. And so God doesn't change. He's called immutable. His attributes don't change. He doesn't necessarily change his being. And he can do that because he is not in the timeline of change. He is above it. Um, he is eternal. So, now, of course, there are more philosophical questions that come from this, and none of them are going to de be dealt with today. Um, but I wanted you to sort of see, here is where John is, John is, John's like floating here in his vision. Um, so here's John, and he is lifted up off this timeline, but he is not given necessarily the full eternal perspective of God. He's just sort of lifted up a little higher so that he can see in figurative language more of what's happening. Okay, So that's kind of the best way to understand what's happening in this text uh, to a degree. That you know, we're operating on this timeline, God's operating up here, and John, by the power of God and the Holy Spirit, um, he is lifted up to see a greater perspective. Okay, I don't know if that's helpful, but it may just cause more problems for me later down the road uh, when you ask me tough questions. So, uh, in 2 through 8, which is what I pointed to before, we saw the 144,000. And the 144,000 are typically regarded uh, typically, uh, who knows what's typical these days when you have so many different interpretations of Revelation. Um, but from the Lutheran perspective in the commentary that I have, the 144,000 are the church militant and not the church triumphant. Now, that's obviously different than what you know your Jehovah Witnesses are going to say or your Seventh-day Adventists, but they don't count um, because we don't care what they think. Um, and so if the 144,000 are the ones that have to be sealed, they're the ones going through trial and tribulation, they're the ones sort of fighting the good fight, and they're doing so on earth, um, and they have to be sealed upon their forehead. And so here we talk, you know, here's the idea of the cross, sign of the cross upon your forehead and upon your heart, which is baptismal language. Uh, and so we are, in a sense, sealed upon our foreheads, um, which is sort of this language of Revelation 7, uh, in our baptism. So we're sealed as those who will fight against, against evil. We are the children of God now, um, as, as St. John says in 1 John. So that first part kind of deals with the church militant, and now John's going to sort of, he, so this, after this I looked, so when you look at the text, after this I looked, what's the this? That's the vision of the church militant. So after he sees the vision of the church militant on earth, this 144,000 who are sealed uh, by the sign of the cross upon their forehead uh, for, for salvation, he then looks and he sees something greater. He sees a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. So looking at verse 9, what we're seeing is the church triumphant. Um, this great multitude are those who are in heaven already, and, or, in a, or have, uh, sure, we'll just stick with that for now. I'm not going to... Uh, wrestle with the language at the moment. Um, so the great multitude is the church triumphant. Those who have who have died in the faith um, and are and are receiving uh, peace before Christ. And so they're from all over the place. So it's not just well, it's not just twelve tribes of Israel. It's everybody uh, who has who has uh, who has shown up. And of course, so so side note here. Um, the 12 tribes of Israel, why are they being included in Revelation in the New Testament church? Is it, are we talking about Israelites? No. Uh, we've talked about before that the church and Israel go hand in hand um, through Christ. So before we had the 12 tribes of Israel, and then through Christ, they transforms into the 12 apostles. And so when Christ, that's why Christ has 12 apostles and not 10 or not 14 or not 16 or 25 or whatever. He has 12 because he is reconstituting Israel through his ministry. And so the church then takes the place of Israel uh, when we talk about 
things in the New Testament are the church age. And so when we're talking about the church militant as these 12 tribes, and like, well, why are they Israel? It's because they're the church. And so this is sort of an image for a large group of, uh, or a great, a countless number of people on earth in the church. Um, so moving back to the text. Um, and so they're before the lamb clothed in white robes. Why are they clothed in white robes? Because those are the robes of righteousness. Um, and they have palm branches in their hands. The palm branches, so the palm branches point to, and of course we're going to remember Palm Sunday, right? Because John, so John is one of the main texts, John 12, John 13, I think John 13, is the Palm Sunday text. I think it's either 12 or 13. I think John 11 is the raising of Lazarus. So that'd be 12 is going to be Palm Sunday, but someone should check that and, you know, make note of it. Uh, but anyway, palm branches point to Palm Sunday and palm branches are the sign of victory. So here we have a symbol of righteousness received. The white robes are the righteousness of Christ. The palm branches represent the victory we have in Christ. And uh, we are before the throne, which is something only the holy can do. Um, and so we are holy and righteous and victorious. Um, I mean, not we, but somebody is. Um, we're holy and righteous because of somebody's victory, namely the Lamb. Um, and so salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Um, and all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they all fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, and then we have um, their, their proclamation. Um, so we have this moment in which uh, we see the church triumphant, um, gathered together around the throne of God in the celebration of victory uh, over evil and death. Uh, which is what Christ has accomplished through his death and resurrection. Um, and so, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And so then, John is, of course, confused because he's this is the first time he's been seeing this and the first time uh, he's encountered this. So, uh, one of the elders addresses John and says, Who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? And John says, I... Sir, you're the only one who knows this. Um, and he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Okay, so that means this great multitude up here that has appeared are those coming out of, so coming out of the great tribulation. Now, what is the great tribulation? Well, See, this is where we have to deal with the rapture people, but we're not going to deal with that too much at the moment. Uh, but the, the simple answer to this is life on earth. Uh, life in our present timeline. This timeline. Those who are stuck here having to deal with sin, death, and the devil. That's the tribulation that we all must face. Living in a broken world full of sin and death. Uh, that's the great tribulation. Um, there isn't some special, even greater tribulation, uh, as if that this world isn't bad enough for us. We have to make it worse before um, it gets better. Uh, no, this is as bad. In a sense, this is as bad as it's going to get. This is the great tribulation that we're living through. Um, and while we're living through this time of turmoil, sin and death, and frustration and grief and shame and all of that. There are some who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. There are some who have been called by the Father uh, as children of God and have been washed in the waters of baptism and made righteous. Uh, this is what is sort of being pointed to. And they have now left the great tribulation. In other words, they have died and are now at rest and at peace in the Lord. And so, therefore, we have this description. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And, the God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So, um, 
here we have this sort of description of um, life before God to a degree. Um, so we see this sort of service in his temple. Uh, God is sitting on his throne. He's sheltering them. No one's hungry. No one's thirsting. No one's being sunburned because of their ginger skin. Um, and nor is there any scorching heat for the lambs in the midst. So there is no, there's no difficulty in there guided to springs of living water, which Christ is the living water, and he wipes away all tears from their eyes because death no longer bothers them. So here is, here is the thing. This text, I think, is pointing us not only to um, our reality. So we have the church militant reality that we didn't really read much of, uh, but it's the 144,000 who are militant, who are fighting the good fight, who are um, sealed by on the sign of the cross, um, fighting against evil. And then we have sort of the, the great multitude in the robes of white who have been, who have left uh, the great tribulation and have now entered into something new. Now, here is where I have to speak less confidently as I would have in, in times past. Um, so, I I'm not necessarily questioning some of the things I'm taught at seminary, um, but I'm trying to fit together um, a complicated issue, um, as in how do we as Christians talk about death? And one of the, I suppose the impetus for this was I got a book in, so I have a subscription to the works of Johann Gerhardt because Concordia Publishing House has been putting them out once a year for the last, I don't know, eight to 10 years. And so every year I get one in the mail, usually in September, which makes my day. Um, and so the most recent one I got was uh, on the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection and the resurrection in general. And the one before that, well, anyway, it skipped over a, a topic. Um, so I got in 1517, or not 1517, in 2017, they put out one on the gospel. And then 2018, they put out one on good works, or I think it was justification. Uh, so one was on justification, one was on good works. And then we have this one on the resurrection. And, and I think there's one somewhere in there too. I forget what it is. And so this book has sort of I've uh, been reading through some of the exegetical or the, the systematic theology of, of Johann Gerhard, who is a 17th century theologian. I think he's up to 1650 or something like that. And one of the reasons I wanted to read him is because uh, I have been overly influenced, and this is not a bad thing, by Dr. Jeff Gibbs. And Dr. Jeff Gibbs has been somewhat on a crusade to bring Christian hope back to the center of the church. Or not center, but close to it, I suppose. Um, in a sense, it's a, it's a part B to the part A of Good Friday. So basically, the, what he is wanting to do, and he's right in, in doing this, is to bring Easter back together with Good Friday as a whole. Because the Lutheran church and other churches in, as well, and especially in America, have dropped the importance of Easter and elevated the importance of Good Friday. So we as evangelicals, as Protestants, and, and even Catholics to a degree, um, are worried far more about our personal individual forgiveness found in Jesus Christ and his cross than we are with the uh, resurrection of the saints and the, the, the end time hope and reality that flows out of Jesus being raised from the dead. And you might think, well, I, sure, but why does that, it's not nearly as important as me being forgiven for my sins, but it is because, you know, the entire early church centered around Easter, not Good Friday. And so Easter has always been sort of the, the prevalent uh, of the two. But as of late, as we have become more individualistic as a society, our emphasis on the communal, the communal or the community hope of resurrection um, has sort of diminished and our individualistic justification has, has increased. And so 
along with that, as our hope, as our biblical hope has diminished in our conversation, what that has allowed is for a false hope to take its place, which is sort of the American Gnostic floating, turning into angels, floating in the clouds, watching over, you know, grandkids play football and helping them win games. Um, and that sort of nonsense where, you know, grandma really helped me win the game. I, I, I played for her and I know she helped me get that game winning catch sort of nonsense. Um, cause none of that is biblical of course, but because we have stopped talking about biblical hope, we have allowed a false hope to take its place. All that has been said before, and I'm all on board on that. But one of the uh, topics that is difficult to sort of sort out for me at the moment, and it has to do with a lot of different biblical verses and trying to properly exegete Old Testament passages, New Testament passages, and deal with it in a systematic theology sort of way and trying to be faithful and within the tradition of the church, is what to do with what is called the intermediate state. So the intermediate state is what theologians call the time between death and the resurrection of the body. And so this text is one of those texts that um, allows for an intermediate state. So the idea behind uh, this text and using it for a justification for the intermediate state goes like this. Um, the, the church militant is at work. Once the people in the church militant die, they then enter into the spiritual realm without their body and are, as St. John describes them, as those dressed in white robes before the throne of God, singing praises with the angels, and sort of having this, um, this life without a body in what is the spiritual realm or the intermediate state. And... This is what a lot of people will call heaven. And so, because it kind of fits in a little bit with that American Gnosticism, or as I talked about in Bible study um, two weeks ago, the escapism of the sort of American faith, which is the idea that earth is bad and we want to escape into the spiritual realm uh, of heaven. And that that's where we belong. We belong in the material, or we belong in the spiritual realm and we want to escape there. That's what death allows to happen. So death is this good guy who helps us escape this bad earth and go to the into heaven, the spiritual realm. And it's called, it's Gnostic. I call it Gnostic because the Gnostics considered anything that was material, anything that was matter, you know, fleshly stuff that you can touch and feel is worse than that which is spiritual, that which you can't touch and feel. And so this is, again, to, to further a little bit of history, this is what's often called Neoplatonic philosophy with a little bit of religion mixed in. And so you have Plato's philosophy of the ideal and the real, and that sort of plays out in that the material things are bad and the spiritual things or the ideal things are better. And that just sort of spirals out. So when we call it, when I say American Gnostic view, this is a Gnostic view of material bad, spiritual good, that's particularly prevalent in America, which we see in our culture. So that's what I mean by American Gnostic viewpoint of, of heaven. And the intermediate state, this doctrine of the intermediate state, fits in as a superseding of the American Gnostic vision. So you can have the American Gnostic vision, you can get rid of that and kind of still keep a little bit of the, if you keep the intermediate state, you get to keep a lot of that hope. So, but here's the problem. Um, there are, there's maybe, maybe one other verse that supports the intermediate status of being real. And so, you have this text from Revelation, and you have the thief on the cross when Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. And so what do we call the intermediate state? We call it paradise when we're going to be sort of faithful to the text. And so what then happens is we have a little bit of this Revelation 7, and we have one statement by Jesus to a thief on a cross 
to justify an entire vision of our Christian hope, which doesn't make any sense, but we do it anyway. And so what we ought to be doing, and this has been my project and why I have literally 10 books on the topic on my desk that I need to read and just, you know, haven't yet, um, that talks about a one of the one of the theologians I've been reading calls it a holistic eschatology or a, a more a more biblically faithful view of what God presents as our Christian hope. And now I talked about faith, hope, and love earlier with John three. And the reason I mention that is because one of the things that sort of it, it, one of the things that seems to have happened, is that as we have lost our biblical Christian hope, we in turn have lost our biblical Christian love. Because we have instead decided that we only focus on faith. So in the faith, hope, and love conversation, we've only kind of been stuck on the faith part. And we don't know what to do properly with the hope part, which is then sort of distorted what we're supposed to be doing with the love part. And as I mentioned, or as I saw in that or showed you in that diagram, the idea here is that we should be able to take our faith, look forward to our hope, and then turn around to the love for our neighbor. And there should be this cycle in which we understand our faith and our hope and our love together, working, uh, working towards this end. And so, the intermediate state then plays a role in if we stop a if we confess it that may be biblically inaccurate but i'm not ready to say that with any definitive sort of this is the way it actually should be uh, though there are plenty who would um, but when we stop at the intermediate state we don't have a reason to love and that's sort of the problem with the intermediate state is our hope and so instead we need to have a fuller biblical hope that points us to the true future of the new heavens and new earth the sort of feet in the dirt, living in resurrected bodies, living in the flesh with other people in which we are serving our neighbor and serving the, the creation, which is the whole purpose of being human in the first place. So, and what, what I, so what that means is if we have proper faith and we understand our hope in terms of that faith, and if we understand our hope properly, then we can understand our life as Christians properly because the life in which we hope for is the life we should be living now. Um, and so if we're hoping for the wrong thing, our lives will be informed by the wrong thing, which is just the whole point of this conversation. I'm obviously getting to an hour, I haven't even talked about uh, the Beatitudes yet, which um, I probably should. So if you want, to kind of have more conversations about this. I'm going to be keep, you know, I'm going to keep reading about it. I'm going to keep trying to sort out exactly what the position of the church is and has been historically. Um, there are, because we're, get, we're getting different, you ask three Lutherans what the, what the intermediate state is and you get three different answers. Um, and so I'm trying to come up with uh, what has been the historic answer and going from there, uh, which requires some reading. Uh, so that was the tangent that I was hoping I wouldn't get too, uh, too much in, but you know, this is one of the things that I'm, this is a current theological project. And so there's a lot of thoughts on my mind when it comes to this topic. Um, and now I've put them on you. So, you know, you can forget it and go back to not worrying about heaven, but I really think you should. Um, because I want you to know your hope, because I think it really will help you understand what you should be doing in life. Um, if you properly understand your Christian hope, then you would properly understand your Christian life as you live it. Um, again, going back to the, uh, to the example I use of, if we don't worry about Christian hope, we don't worry about Christian life, then we can just drown the baby in the baptismal waters and we can just let it die and, you know, because hope in, in the Christian life don't seem to matter. If it's just about faith and going to heaven, then we can just drown babies, um, which I have not drowned any babies, so don't worry about that. Um, but anyway, let's look at Matthew 5, 
somewhat quickly because, you know, we don't have all day. So Matthew 5, 1 to 12, I think this will probably be the sermon text because obviously you don't want me doing that rant in the pulpit for Revelation chapter 7. Obviously. So Matthew chapter 5, 1 to 12. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Okay, now this is a text that most Christians have heard numerous times, but maybe you haven't yet. And maybe you've been listening to it wrong um, because sometimes what happens here with the Beatitudes is you take these statements and you turn them into rules or guidelines for your Christian life. But let's, let's start with the first part, which is um, we're going to start at verse 3. Um, if I'm going to preach on this, it's probably going to be on three through six because you can't do the whole thing. And I don't know, you could probably spend 20 minutes on just one of these, but um, we'll see what you know the sermon looks like uh, in a couple days. So first thing to recognize is this is poetic language. And if you're going to deal with poetry, uh, fine. Uh, but a lot of people aren't very good at poetry, including your pastor. So one of the first things you can do is rearrange the words. So, if we were to fix it, as in a regular sentence, you would say, the poor in spirit are blessed for or because, because you can use, for and because are the same word in Greek, so you can change it to because. So the poor in spirit are blessed because, again, switching it around here, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Okay, so by moving some words around, you have a much more clear statement. The poor in spirit are blessed because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Now, again, we're talking Matthew, and we've been doing this in the parables as of, as of late. Kingdom here should be reign or the rule of heaven. Uh, so we're talking here about the work of Christ as king. Um, and so the poor in spirit, those who have nothing in terms of the spirit, so the people who don't have any spiritual um, value, I suppose, or gifts or um, treasure, they are poor, their hands are empty, um, the reign of heaven is for them, and so they are blessed. So Christ, in other words, you can take verse 3 and simply say, Jesus Christ comes in his life, ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension for all those who have nothing spiritually. Okay. Next one. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Those who mourn are blessed because they shall be comforted. Well, how will those, those who are mourn be comforted? Well, through the reign of heaven, through the work, life, ministry, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. How does that comfort those who mourn? Well, we've got the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of Jesus comforts those who mourn. Next one. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The meek, or the weak, the weak ones are blessed because they will inherit the earth. Now, here's something important to point out. 
What earth are they inheriting? Because it's not the present one, right? The meek, the weak, the humble, they are not sitting on top of thrones at the moment. They are not the ones who are given the world on a platter. Um, not that that's going to happen in the future either. Uh, but when we think about inheriting the earth, we're thinking about living on the new heavens and new earth. This is where they will be blessed. Not on this earth, as in this current time frame, but on the new heavens and new earth, which will be like this earth. You know, it'll have dirt and people and, you know, flesh and stuff. Uh, and so it is those who are humble and receive the king, who are poor, so the meek or the humble, who are poor in spirit and who mourn the death of those around them who receive the reign of God um, or the reign of heaven through Jesus Christ's life, ministry, death, and resurrection, who will be comforted in the raising of the dead and will receive the new heavens and the new earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are blessed because they will be satisfied. How will they be satisfied? They're going to receive some sort of food and drink. Maybe the bread of life and the river of life. which is found in the reign of heaven. So again, Christ becomes the center point for, those, for this verse because those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are going to be satisfied in the righteousness given to them through Christ. Christ's life, ministry, death, and resurrection provides the righteousness that all of us need to become children of God and be satisfied. Then we have verse 7, the merciful are blessed, for they shall receive mercy. Why? Because they are living like their God. They are living the reality of the reign of heaven. They're living as Christ would have us live, because Christ is merciful, and so they too will receive the mercy that they have given. The pure in heart are blessed, for they shall see God. Those who have been made righteous those who have been humble enough to receive the righteousness of God and who are in or are receiving the comfort of the resurrection of the dead, who have made themselves pure as God is pure, they shall see God because he calls them pure. The peacemakers are blessed because they will be called the sons of God. Those who bring forgiveness and reconciliation into this world through the reign of Christ, the reign of heaven, uh, will be called sons of God because they are sons of God, because they are living as the Father lives. They are merciful as he is merciful. They are pure as he is pure, and he brings peace as we are called to bring peace. And so these sons of God, sons and daughters, doesn't have to be just sons, but women are included here as peacemakers. Um, and so... This, again, is connected back to the reign of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we have the reign. Why? Because our, the reign of heaven is given even to those who are persecuted. Why? Because Christ will be persecuted. Why? Because those who do not know the Father do not know those who follow after the Father. Uh, which is why we have this idea of the persecuting of the prophets. Those who were called... Uh, to speak for God, to be his representatives, we're also persecuted. So when we are living this life, then we too will be persecuted because the world does not know us, nor the Father who sent us. And so all of this flows out of the reign of heaven. And so with this text, Dr. Gibbs, said, so Dr. Gibbs wrote the Matthew commentaries for the, for the Big Blue and uh, Dr. Gibbs talks about how this text, which is Matthew chapter 5, it's the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, is the doorway into the rest of the sermon. In other words, you can't understand what Jesus says in Matthew 
excuse me, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 without first passing through the doorway of the Beatitudes. And the doorway presents to us a story of our salvation in the reign of heaven, the salvation of through in and through Christ. Um, and so if you don't understand that idea of our own, if you don't understand your own story of salvation in terms of Christ, you won't understand anything else that's said in Matthews 5, 6, and 7. And so it's the doorway in which we enter and the door in which we constantly have to re-enter as we deal with difficult passages in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, how do we deal with the, some of the texts about uh, if you even hate your brother in your heart, you have murdered him? Um, you know, how do you deal with that? Well, first you have to walk through that door of the reign of heaven and the purity that we're being called to and the peacemaker that we're being called to and this mercifulness that we're being called to as Christians who live in the reign of heaven. That's how we begin to understand and sort of sort out all the other texts that come after this. So when we understand the Beatitudes properly, we understand not only who we are as Christians, but what that life then entails um, as, as the sermon goes further. Uh, so that's sort of a, a quick run through. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna worry too much that I didn't go through a lot of that, uh, only because I plan to preach on it, and so uh, I don't want to you know spoil the sermon or something like that. Um, so that's the three texts um, plus a rant or two. So you know those who love that, um, you're welcome. Uh, those who don't, I don't know why you'd watch this video if you didn't like it when I rant on something. Um, but you know whatever. So. Uh, thanks for coming to watch this video. I'm glad to have you back after two weeks off. Um, and, uh, and I'll see you next time, if not in church, on this Sunday. Have a great rest of your week.